of art is to temple and to escape is to survive. Among the many stone Buddhas, a novice from Luan Prabang, barely half my naive years, beneath Bo's loose robes, caught seconds before the next orange prayer, walking towards Nirvana, his smile precocious. I wondered if someday in a distant century we would see a statue of him paving the way for my children. A discussion of monsters. In America, monsters arrive through Ellis Island or from the stars or morning's rogue angels. In Asia, the ghosts hop, hair long, eyes black, and girls from Taiwan will squeal in terror at that lonely world, but laugh with disdain at Hollywood soulless piles of pixels and latex signifying obsolete demons. and archaeology of snow forts. There's not much left to be said some well-washed stone hasn't heard before. History is composed of broken walls and bad neighbors. Just ask these chips from Berlin, the Parthenon and Cafe, or these cool magma hands of Pompeii, dark and gray. If you listen carefully in the right place on University Avenue, you will learn there's a minor wall near the Yalu River dancing on the hills of Chin for the moon. Who knows exactly what I mean? in every ton worth mention. She's moonlighting as a curved garden serpent, coiling around old Leokoan, the suspicious one with an astute eye, crooning with a sly wink. Come, touch true history. And how the moon must laugh when she spars the tiniest hill in Minotanka, where the small hands of the earth have created a magnificent white wall, a snowy miniature Maginot, raised some scant hours before, already melting into a hungry, roiling river, was not yet finished eating Louisiana for brunch. Babylon Gallery. She brought the gray spoon we hung upon the gallery wall from the Talat stalls in downtown Ponsavon. She was supposed to be collecting Danen, folk tales, and we was showing off the art we were so certain would change the way the world sees that stumbled elephant we rode in on. She was an indelicate work, this one. A light cockatrice feather, crude malice her center, her bowl an echo of bomb craters whispering mad as Gorgon. They dine of spoons like this all over here, we're informed. Hammered from war scraps for dogs find indigestible. They sold me this one, certain it's American bullets at the core. It was time, they said, we took them back. I pondered how many startled people this carnivorous spoon passed through in previous incarnations, karma denying her a role in a finer flatware set for the saints. Oddly, for as many threads as she cut short, she was too weak to be the butter knife she should have been. Swords into plowshares, someone scribbled casually in the comment card. One of many remarks, disposable as plastic sporks. Burning Eden, one branch at a time. My father, a skull before the wars were over, never saw my mother's flight in terror as our humbled kingdom fell to flame and shell. My mother was stripped to income under bureaucrats, a number for the raw statistics of jungle errors collated into cold ledgers marked classified. My feet, dangling in the Mississippi, have forgotten what the mud in Vinchan feels like between your toes while my hands hold foreign leaves and I whisper, maple, oak, weeping willow, as if saying their names aloud will rebuild my home. Cameos. People would be surprised how often you truly show up in these poems of mine, among various fantasies of lost civilizations and tongues, or words for beauty and justice for a wondrous era yet to come on worlds, vast light years from Gutter and Draconis or Orion, where perhaps Lao outdid everyone by surprise after all, despite that shaky start since Yin Bin Fu in a galaxy far away from an alternate timeline no one recalls. And you, you never recognize yourself in the tiny corner of these verses or of a moment we shared in a brief lifetime in that city we almost dared call home. Democracia. Father was a tiger, ground beneath the wheels, 
This fat was burned to light a torch, but there's no liberty here. Only the ashes of a village that couldn't evolve, where ghost grandchildren play with ghost grandparents, and the parents are nowhere to be seen at all. Where have they gone? Where have they gone? A delay of a day for an idea? A delay of a lifetime for the dead upon the ground? Look what remains. This hut hasn't the ambition of Ozymandias. These craters were once a rice field. This ox was no man's enemy. And what we have left to say could explode any minute. Diasporas like rivers. Winding through the course of our lives, memories like so many fish of war and loss, love and family. Time takes its toll, ruthless, unrelenting. The factory floor, the classroom so rarely requires an understanding of the distance between Saigon and Vinchan, Lan Chen or Din Bien Phu, let alone a high school horror story in 1970s Phnom Penh. Our ancestors would weep at half of what we've forgotten already. Our parents just want to eat one thing that reminds them of the old country. In the classrooms, the children hide their lunch from frying peers who've no appreciation for nut mam, badek, or purple sticky rice. The other day, a man came by who knew where we were from for once, tried to say, we're not so different between the Macon and the Mississippi, 10,000 lakes and as many stories. I want to be polite, accept that bridge, sturdy as for 35, but 45 years later, our stirred story can't be condensed into a made-for-TV miniseries, roots tangled, filtering, growing beneath a cold northern star, more than bamboos amid the pines, the oaks, whatever it takes to rebuild. I gather my fishing pole, a cassette recorder, my family for a weekend away from it all. Maybe the water will cleanse us, maybe the stories will return, sometimes a trickle, sometimes a flood. Pluribusunum. Ewer tells me a story over a hot hibachi, how she went to Laos to see her lucky sisters for the first time in two decades, since the country has loosened up enough to let tourists like us in. Isn't it beautiful, she asks me. Ben says she gave her sister Mary fifty dollars to help her family. When Ewer returned to the Twin Cities, she learned her sister had been murdered for the money by Mary's ex-husband, who'd heard of their family reunion and thought the cash rightfully belonged to him. Did you give your relatives anything, she asks. Yes, I reply, $500, but they say they need more to get to America. Hmm. It's a monster. Aus das Kind kind war, war es die Zeit der folgenden Fragen. Warum bin ich, ich und warum nicht du? I began like Pooh, the uncarved block in a strange land. Simulacrum, wood golem knocking about, dreaming of flesh. Lies, truths, growths, recede and wonder what is to be. Du venons nous, que sommes nous, où allons nous? Where come we Where sind we Where are we Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? How long have I got? Father never answers. Why he is surprised when I bolt a prodigal arrow into a world I can only suspect among gears and puppets. Wonder the world. I saw a boy herd an ox. I saw a drog dropping bones in the water, barking for more. I saw a bathing woman with a beggar on a crutch of wood. I saw a wretch with a dead albatross and the archers whose arrows were beyond them. I may have seen a fleet in Vanity Fair, some carnival of souls. I saw a mon orphan calling Nagakins from the riverbank, expecting nothing. More like Leviathan, peer of Melville's albino, abyssal gaze returned. Within your belly like a worm, after a lifetime of fighting, how I've become like you, adrift in the sea, Jonah, a leaf, 
while the boy next to me has become a jackass. And yet I still wish and yearn, Dionysian, a destiny, if not a dynasty. Bobby, you'll be pleased to know. The guillotine stopped falling on heads in France by the year I was born. After just one last fellow, whose name I cannot find, nor his crime. I admit, I have not looked very far into the matter. Curiosity is one thing, morbidity is another. Father, I saw you in the shadows of my mirrors. An elusive memory, known only through my mother, described as widow of, after she signed those papers releasing me for adoption by the Americans, a paper bird. And I know you by features mother and I do not share. Those jungles are distant assassins of my identity. I cannot lift the leaves of that last tree that held you and cursed the poor arboreal nursing. It would change nothing. Accusations are futile. Your last words are lost, my father, and I would never have understood them anyway. I cannot put you to rest. I cannot pronounce your family name. You are just bones among bones that cannot get up. You are a smile, gleaming, white as wax melting, scattered and dust in the mountains of our ancestors. In your wake, I rise forth with a most delicate of freedoms. Five Fragments Only seven people walked away from S-21. My critics asked me to find the beautiful words to make this more than a statement, chase the rhythms and meter to propel this into true poetry. Aesthetics mustn't die in literature. Don't starve language with your emaciated lyric. Don't keep back the flourishes that will set these words apart, where anger and memories will become only passing wind, and the tattered spines of your work about this camp will be thrown into the garbage without even the pomp of a Berlin book burning. Surely the 14,000 would appreciate that, who have no eyes, no voice, no hands to applaud and cheer anymore. They want me to splash in Pol Pot's rivers and to find the true tears when we have fallen rain. But if you ask my neighbors across the hall, you will find a particular indifference whether I succeed or not. When the portraits came in black and white, stained and torn out of place of artistic intent, they were mounted upon a plain white wall in the Weissman Museum, across from a stout statue of a squatting Buddha and his irresponsible smile. Recovered from the mud after the Khmer rogues went running, there were no names, only stench of numbers that meant nothing the next day in the camp. How many years have they been touring these haunted faces, hoping someone would recognize them long enough to restore names to them? If a words, it's tragic, cross your lips, the odds increase horrifically that you will give the matter no further thought within hours. In the other gallery, the on solemn cabinet of curiosities, custom assembled for the university, was amusing the spectators with all the charm of a Renaissance scholar. All the usual divisions were there, underworld, sea and air, the terrestrial realm, humankind, the library and archive, the allegory of vision, the allegory of sound and time, the allegory of history. Gaze upon the sodomites descent into hell, a specimen of algae, a large hand-painted fan, a freeze-dried cow lung, a set of black Chinese binding shoes, both in forceps from the late 1800s, whose modern counterparts have barely changed, a Napoleonic teapot, in the words of Yul Brenner, etc., etc., etc. The day I went, a young woman in green muttered to her boyfriend, What is this junk from the basement? It's not art, and it doesn't belong here. Moments later, he replied thoughtfully, I wish they validated parking. When the B-52s pummeled Nyak Lon by accident, over a hundred Khmer died without cause, for no more ceremony than a shrill whistle and a burst of flame and shrapnel from a mile high. Ambassador Swank, who came to assuage the grief of those who survived with the grand gesture of $100 bills, American, according to an anguished footnote from a man who had read about the matter in a London paper at the time. A woman I know from a village near Angkor Wat tries to escape the nightmares of the camps today by filling her house with tropical trees and flowers from her homeland she remembered as a little girl. In 1990, over an after-school match of Trivial Pursuit, my teacher asked, what is the name of a country where Pol Pot instituted year zero, killing thousands of his countrymen? 
Cambodia, I answered with certainty, confident and familiar. No, he replied. No, what the hell is it then? The card says Cambodia. It's the same thing. No, it's not. Ten years later, I can't believe I argued over that point as I stare at crude wooden tables piled with scarves near Phnom Penh. In two years, I don't believe I've said more than a dozen words to my, to my neighbors in the apartment below me. That's just the way it is. The other day, I walked past the grandmother trying to talk to her mon counterpart across the hall. Broken English, hesitant and uncertain, become the bridge as each stood in their doorway, fumbling towards something resembling an ordinary conversation. Gardening and grandchildren seemed to be the subject. I still don't know what to make of it all. My head, heavy as a mango, without a mouth to feed. On John, I know. My young brother worries one day, after all it took to live here, his new nieces, who haven't even been born yet, won't understand a word of his poetry, or how to dance with an elephant, let alone a Kinley or a New York Apsara. Putting Huasai on the literary map after centuries is a precedent, but is it poetry? To tell someone from tomorrow, Sabaidi, how are you, from someone who cared enough to leave notes? Is that all a Lao poem can be in the shadow of Camp Pendleton? I show him a copy of CIA Dope Calypso. Why should a white howl be the very last word? I smile as he shows all he can do with a pen. They fling us at empires when a cosmos needs to die, engineered by the best AI minds of New Lancha. In the boot tubes we sing, they'll never let us in, they'll never let us in to holy him upon, not quite monkey, not quite man. In the future, true havoc needs more than a mere dog for war. Lautonium shell around a simian soul, dropping through the sky, ready to die, armed to the bone with three strong hearts, tailored for express mayhem and murder of your pristine social orders. We close our eyes with enough time to dream. Six hard minutes through the hot atmosphere, visions of fabled Dalvanon, our own planet, our own Caesar, our own books of law and liberty. Ape shall never kill ape, no spill blood, the joys of Ahimsa, a distant world keeping all of your promises made to us for 400 centuries. Golden Triangle, Holy Mountain. Why ever see poppies in their natural habitat? How red they appear in all of these pictures besides mountain women with their dark turbans, dour and thin, up to their waists in grass. Leftover bombs loiter at their cautious feet, who have no time for strangers pleading with them to say, cheese, gone with a flash of light before the harvest is done. Her body, my monuments. Feels as a thirsty knock in April, nestled in a dress, the hue of sleepy tat dam on Chanta Kumen. Her lissom stride awakes dreamers, the colors of a world, the children of rivers, our sandalwood city, where talats greet the moon, pee dance with dreams, and the future begins to stir, not with a yawn, but her laugh, a gaze that is known stars, the way others know flowers. In the beginning, depending on the tradition you hear, there was nothing, or there was chaos. No time, no space, not even a single atom, not a ray of light, a whisper, no scent of papaya or rivers. Not a body, not a soul, not a ghost of a dok champa, or even a memory of a touch in the darkness, or a taste of a home-cooked meal from a tiny garden in the window of a dreaming woman, asleep amid her books and clothes, her brushes and tools. In the beginning, though, there was no hate, no war, no anger, no constant return to life after life because of our ignorance and lust. Still, I look back with no regrets at our world of fires and love, of ice and hope. My mouth opens in song in the brief time upon earth I have, creating amid destruction, growing against silence.
Ink, a recipe. Mo, ink, two characters. Hey, black, earth, do. Labor to make this fluid in illumination. Zhao Quanzhi in the 12th century composed both Mo Qin, the ink classic. For every dynasty prior and pending, the revered liquid was a foundation for constancy and changes. Where there is a wall, there is word. The basic stay. Lamp black and glue. Draw a lamp black from fine harvests, special pines ignited. By a flightless feather brush, your soot collected is mixed with glue pure as heart horns, the hides of the hunted and the tame. Good ink depends on good glue. This gives texture, life, the living, the burnt, bound. Perhaps we could consider memories, dreams, teeming within, a weight in a brush, a pen, a surface, an open eye in a human face. We, creatures of carbon and voids, in our humanity alone need ink. When a drop of ink is spilled or dries without a word, a stroke of note, in some imaginative corner of creation, something divine cries silently. Gel goes in hot, comes out hot, but this may be more than the casual student will want to know. Mom's grinding chilies for me in Modesto. Red, green, a dash of fresh cilantro, fermented shrimp sauce and a pinch of salt between her mortar and pestle. Dab in a sticky ball of cow meal into the tiny ceramic saucer, I know. She's a sorceress in her kitchen, trying to find a way to say she loves me, hoping my prodigal tongue is still loud enough to understand what her broken English cannot convey. My eyes are cisterns of tears after 30 years. I should say, my bet, and grab some cold milk. But with a smile through the pain, I stammer, Zep lai me, delicious mom. Zep lai, hak me, lai lai. Don't talk, just eat, she says between her tears. Jaganyai. For my heart is a dinosaur, and you but a cold meteor. Fly as you will to my atmosphere. I'll return in my own way. Perhaps it's poultry, perhaps a gallon of diesel, some polished paperweight, or mixed in the concrete knock in a temple for a thousand souls who will come back many times because they couldn't let go without regret. Japanism, Laoism. Grown in the shadow of maples and pine cones when the actor was in the Oval Office, there were nearly no books about my realm of a million elephants. A tattered issue of National Geographic was my closest glimpse of a land I left 30 years ago as a waif. Like all of those impressionable French in Paris, after Paris' thunderous stunt in the Yokohama docks, we were busy watching the toys and diodes pouring in from the Ginza. Shogun warriors and roaring atomic monsters smashing Tokyo's matchstick streets occupied our children while Detroit and Zenith squirmed at their foreign market share wailing about MacArthur and our post-war treaties. A word sub ID was unheard of, and instead it was better to learn to say sayonara while raising shrimpy shrubs sold as stylish bonsai. Then, papayas were as rare as pad thai. It was sushi that was all for rage, as wasabi horseradish set your nostrils afire, gasping for water. I was trained to revere razor-sharp katanas in Zen, stoic as a bowl of udon. The heroes of my father in the ruins of Lanshan and Luan Paban were barely footnotes, ground into mud in the aftermath of the wars no one wanted to remember. And now my skeletal editors call on me with their chattering skulls. Where are your words for Fanum and Chao Anu, or the fallen honored at the Patrusai? In all this time, surely one word about Frenchan will not kill you or your friends. It's hard to answer, sitting down to eat in July. Write what you know, my teachers admonish. 
Sipping my soda, I turn the pages of a weathered book on Van Gogh prints inspired by Hokusai and the ukiyo-e and Sai. My flag is as obsolete as the word Indochine. I realize today I am older than my father lived to be. It's been too long since I last saw an elephant or a monstrous river catfish. They tell me somberly the freshwater Irrawaddy will be extinct before the next time I come by. I couldn't sketch any of them worth a damn if I tried. A part of me wants to smack the next person who says, I won't be Lao if I don't write about Laos. Do cops stop being cops when they're arguing about the White House and crooked pardons? Do robbers become priests if they talk about faith? Riviera saw the peaks of Hiroshima's Fujiyama among Eiffel's iron girders and still died French and human. Just right, young man, I hear my father whisper. Just right, and we'll sort it all out later. With the last bite, I return to making my own book with a defiant smile. Cop jar for nothing, Valan. A bomb popped in his face while he was digging a fire pit for his family squatting on the old mercenary camp in Shenquan province so notorious for its UXO. They live there for the American plumbing, our host said flatly, watching the volleyball games by the airstrip. This was holy routine. The ruined grounds were frozen. Explosives, dormant blooms below, can be mistaken for ice and rock easily. And he screamed a whole while as we loaded him into the back of our rickety plane to Vinchan that now aviation picked up from the Russians when everyone thought the Cold War was going somewhere. The California girl on holiday was aghast and found it quite unscenic. What a pall on her search for highs. In Vatin Ben, a monk named Suk confided discreetly, we really hate hippies. Laos in the house. When has a house gone Lao? There may not be one precise event. It's not only the first time a fresh batch of badek is made by grandma. It takes more than a few servings of tamakun in the kitchen. A six pack of cold Heinekens and beer Lao in the creaking cooler, or bottles of very fine cognac and homemade rice whiskey can't combine by themselves in the cabinet for this magic moment, awaiting the change like good guests like a cluttered porch of friendly shoes and worn sandals. Yes, a living room basi calls many things, so can talk of be my Lao or makeshift shelves for those Lao icons we all know so well. But even a happy knock in the hall is not all that's needed for transformation. Such a house does not require Lao dramas, but it's surprising if those don't eventually show up, as certain as a child's tears from their first taste of gel at the family table. Sense of mint and bamboo and barbecue sunk into the beans? Watching someone live out their silipin dreams in a basement just because they found a microphone and a synthesizer? Not the soul keys, and neither is a sincere gop jai, surprisingly. Maybe you invited Matt and I and all of my family from every corner. We might speak of numbers and lotteries and years as refugees, host to a thousand small arguments and soft mangoes, Memories of Chinatowns, gilded vats, and the buildings of antiquity. These all build a house, a nation, a people holding together. And in that house there will be dreams, things lost and things sought. One by one they shuffle in with a bright smile, white as grains of warm cow. But a house has gone now only when the hearts within have chosen so. Free as the wind, remembering like stones, growing flowers, for moving stars. Look, Lao. We meet on the road but once, and I cannot tell you, in the time we have. We are one. What's left? What survived? What remains of old dreams, old wars, old loves? We share atomic lives, small, brief, unpredictable orbits, curious flurries of motion and smiles. Who you become after I go, I can only guess, except by the photos of occasional tour and strangers in which I watch you grow, while you remember an eye, a camera, a wave goodbye. Liberty. A tree of liberty devours the loyal, 
grind in them between burning flag teeth and a ton of open doors. Blue lakes formed in the footprints of Babe, while the trail of tears formed the bloody river. Washington had a thing for breaking cherry trees and raising hemp that was good for strong ropes to bind us all together in a frenetic world of neckties and necessities. No one knows the names of Afghan heroes or Hmong veterans whose fathers raised opium crops now littered with landmines. Few can tell you where Russia is, even after 50 years of cold wars in tropical nations they never vacationed in personally. They would be unable to tell you how many of our allies are in an impossible debt negotiating a cost-effective betrayal. But they can tell you about friends and Miss October. Miscellaneous documents outlining illiterate farmers with $200 anti-tank weapons have surfaced to air our missile mania, a culture where no one sees the irony of naming a million-dollar cruise missile after a tomahawk while defanged reservations cope with underfunded schools. People laugh as immigrants report stories of American giants who press you beneath their green thumbs stained with dollars when it's time to eat. Cannibalized ideas and epics lay exhausted, scattered apple seeds and urban canyons formed by alien policies of war and leverage, and a great love of sequels. Half of the nation has never seen an orchard, only the recycled city papers they are being ignored in as usual. Somehow, the Cubans managed to preserve the purity of baseball and cigars, while we still can't imagine the rules to Canadian curling, despite our open borders. And strangely, when a laughing yellow cab driver who was a former engineer from Iraq tells me about U.S. chemical weapons and acid rain, I'm just not as surprised as I wish I could be. His last words rang like a cracked bell outside of a smoking capital of conspiracies. When there's a new war, watch. A refreshing new ethnic restaurant will open in your neighborhood soon. Midwestern Conversations. You're the whitest guy I know, Nate tells me over a backyard barbecue at the end of high school. It's supposed to be a compliment. You speak English even better than some of the students who were born here, a teacher tells me after hours. And it's true. I'm pulling you over, sir. Because frankly, you look like one of the bad guys, a cop tells me, his hand on a holstered Glock in Ohio. And you've got an awful lot of cash on you. But I'm just getting my rent for my landlady, who doesn't trust my checks. The other day, a young writer sent me a poem entitled, I Can Be White. My heart can't give it an iota of serious consideration, although it's entirely possible I'm just projecting. Missoula, 1976. At three years old in Montana, I became a citizen on Flag Day during the American Bicentennial. That and a cup of coffee gets you a cup of coffee, even if you write a thousand poems for a million elephants. I didn't stay there, of course, but in this city I met my first ghosts and dinosaurs, gorgons and ancient gods. I played with a young girl named Dulcinea, discovered the family pigs eaten by a bear, and saw my first neighbor die, crushed beneath a fallen telephone pole. I wish I remembered his name. Our family dog Dutch, in his tragic jealousy, tried to kill me a few times. I still have one scar from it after 40 years. But I miss him anyway, because that's the way refugee memory works. My Secret War Within the first film in the world to feature Lao was Chang, by the man who would one day film King Kong with ample Fei Rui. He never returned to the heirs of Lan Chan, but he died among New Year's and April Fools in the year I was born, when covert American bombs stopped falling like steel rain over the realm of a million elephants. Dr. Dooley played Dumble for us in the hills, flying pachyderms and talking crows, useless feathers, something about belief while ravens, fans of Poe, dug into the plane of jars, and we made f fresh ghosts for the next generation. I never understood their stories until years later, when my father, almost dead from a thousand smokes, referred to them as heroes, pointing to a portrait of a young boy who could have been me in another un-American lifetime by these men, M16 in hand, smiling 
for a reporter's camera. On Voyage of Detroit, I grew up among Godzilla films, the aliens of UHF. Alarming, relentless, a comfort more family than the silent faces of Apocalypse Now, or slinky women who promised love for a long time if I understood American dollars and full metal jackets. My teacher tries to show me the Joy Luck Club, Air America. Here is the truth of who you are, surely. I return to alien nation, enemy mine. They live, but thin. My love says I can't tell my story talking about other people's films. No one's seen half of what you watched. No one's seen half of what I lived, I reply, trying to shred my life into ink just to remain. Maddie Doe made a ghost movie the other day, Chantilly, shows me. We can't talk about half of the worlds we've had, our wars gone by, her crazed ghosts, mine. Little Laos on the Prairie magazine gets a letter from a man who wants to make a movie about our war, says he knows a great place to shoot in Hawaii, same, same, but different, spread the word, send some cash. He has a cause, his special vision, if not the facts. I lost his number and cast my father's ashes into the Mississippi. The last I heard, he now wishes he'd talk to assassins instead. Narratives of Anox heirs. Never read my life as the diary of some sad refugee. My account is not intended as a routine narrative of adversity overcome. Mere survival, once again, transcending a descent to white-hot hell, converted to the placid limbo of frogs. No, I miss the familiar strange here in a way you cannot fathom. Our hard ghosts remain vigilant, thin as an ink scratch on an old palm leaf, haunting with a ton claimed incomprehensible. The old signposts have been lost, but in strangeness, possibility. I hope, moving, a shadow in uncertain passages, making melodies for newsless souls. In daring this, might I shape some limitless star? We, scrambling to replace what we barely knew, barely recognize our tangled metamorphosis, our hymns of recovery, organs of uncertain purpose in the body cosmic, mistaken easily for endings, not new beginnings. Night. The roots of true evening are not a pale measure of time, of distance between, stellar bodies, bright flames, divine orbits of shadows. Night arrives, a limb graceful as a gilded court dancer of Lan Chan, her hair unfurling by onyx inches with a smile bright as her first Dok Champa in bloom, departs in the morning like a dream, a beauty in an orange dress. Note regarding the living heart. A single sea can turn into a forest, a single heart can transform a nation. To be brave is Jai Ka. To be generous is Jai Kwan. To test the body, climb a mountain. To test the soul, meet another. To find happiness, meet as strangers, but don't stay that way. With a sub ID, greet the days one by one. With a kop jai and a smile, do what you can to change worlds even one inch, one hand at a time. That is the path of a jai, human and forever growing. On a stairway in Nan Paban. Step as you will through life, a thousand ways, a thousand places. Carry a home in your heart or spend years seeking the door where your soul will always smile. Do you ease the way for others or just yourself? Do you climb great mountains just to leave them unchanged? One day, the heights of Holy Pussy will lay your soft valleys and we only memories, but our children's children will they too have reason to smile, like those dreaming strangers who finished their stairs for us. Passa Falan. En route to our cafe rendezvous on University Avenue, debating sushi, pho, or nachos, everything bagels or decadent croissants, famished literary ninjas crammed in a car 
or were we Roman gung-ho samurai, pondering our ink-filled avatars for verbose madam from Phnom Penh who loves to sing Domo Erigato, Mr. Roboto, and every stanza of Bohemian Rhapsody at karaoke reminds me, sub ID will always be a foreign word. Aloha, America, of thee I sing. To be frank, big trouble in Little Champasak probably isn't going to be in the matinee crowds we need. It might not make it to sci-fi, let alone lifetime. Your pitch for Dr. Sunmay strikes again wasn't quite the response to Battle Him of a Tiger Mother we were looking for. Zombies stretch our budget a bit too far. The Betrayal may have gotten an Oscar nomination, but that won't buy you lunch on this side of town. Not even a used hubcap for a junky Gran Torino. You laugh too much at your origin stories. If you survive CIA black ops and make it to America, you need tears galore, or no one takes you seriously. An enduring smile and a sub-ID for being alive in diaspora is unbelievable. No one's that unbreakable. No one. Nobody knows what's so funny about an American werewolf in non Praban. They definitely won't buy the story of Dracula, immune to garlic and lemongrass, but dreading pungy steaks. Sleepless in Savannah Get will not be the feel-good breakout rom-com of the year for obvious reasons, even with Angelina. Neither will How Supane Got Her Groove Back. Let's try with Fresh Off the Starships, but that's a hard pass. We had in mind more of a Miss Saigon with Pad Thai meets the Joy Luck Slumdog namesake in translation for your undiscovered country. It's premature to be discussing the shared universe between Elephant Stomp Princess of Laos and Lao Warrior. We won't lay the groundwork for La exploitation cinema with your avenging Morlom Godfather. Little Laos on the Prairie, the music, oh, has a shot, but we can't see a love interest for Matt Damon. <sighs> You're frustrated, but remember, you don't exist in America without a movie about yourselves these days. What are you going to do? Write a poem? Yeah. Good luck with a better Giovanni. Poultry. Scrawny daughters of dinosaurs, your lovers never shut up, preening in streets filled with black feathers, as if every hour is the start of a new day, and the sun won't ascend without them. Beneath your bamboo domes I see every soft throat with its destiny of edge and demise. You're in hot water, losing every frantic thread that failed your sad quest for flight. Your legs stiffen without eulogies, and your wings can't pray their petitions to the god of the Archaeopteryx for delivery. Arriving in St. Paul, immigration asks me if I've been in contact with livestock. I want to say, are you kidding? Have you ever even been to my homeland? Looking out to the rising sun, my breakfast will never see again. Returning. Growing up in the Midwest in the 1980s, I ran into the idea of Varen back again, of shires and armies and the mistakes of old men, to say nothing of monsters, of magic, an appreciation for roads and places undreamt by youth from Vinchon, the realm of a million elephants. Going on the road or on travels with Charlie seemed so far away, even as the poet's road became mine. The other day, I drove across acres of olives and almonds and wine to ports filled with coffee and fish, dancers from Nanchan. There was a stop in Missoula, a memory of vows and naturalization, a hot dog under big sky, hounds barking like Cerberus, keep going. In Sturgis, they love motorcycles and handguns. In Wall, there's jackalopes and plague-ridden prairie dogs. I wake up in the Midwest again, visiting Tufi Kaiju, a rusting robot from the future. I cannot tell you any more who was invading, who was defending. A singer I knew found fame beneath a clown's grease paint, while I, 
tell you of stars I know where I'll never set foot. Memory is a writhing hydra, yet I feel this poem most when it is Hercules with a sputtering torch. Sticky Rice Blues I've seen it a thousand times in a dozen years, read the rules, watched the videos, talked it over until someone's turned a different color. You never feel less Asian than days you burn rights. But it's possible, even with a brand new bamboo steamer, a fistful of cotton some heat and water. Some days, it's easier to be a cat in a temple, a morning fog, a frog splashing into a pond, a hungry ghost on a holiday, waiting for a bell from hell to ring. Surprises in America It took me by surprise that Hitler was a vegetarian. Rudolf Hess, too. I remember reading about them as a boy. I remember the outrage when someone asked us to forgive them because the two would pet their dogs before night. It took me by surprise that Soldier of Fortune magazine offered a reward for Idi Amin, paid in gold, dead or alive. It was a lot of money. What does it say when mercenaries set bounties on tyrants' heads? It took me by surprise that we weren't always the good guys. What couldn't we buy in the land of the free? Why couldn't we go where we weren't welcome? It struck me by surprise that many people didn't believe I was an American when I had lived here all of my life, except for that two-day trip to Toronto. If they had told me instead that my mother had died, I don't think I would have been as surprised. The Buddha of Bombies There were more cluster bombs than people in Laos. They stopped falling in the year I was born. America left soon after. The other day, a young woman I know saw people turning war scrap into fashionable bracelets. No one considers turning them into statues of Buddha. Recycling only goes so far out here. A third of those who die every year are under twelve, caught in the hot, swift center of flame and shrapnel, dormant for nearly four decades. Most of their parents weren't even born when these lethal leftovers were dropped. In America, my nieces sing, London Bridge is falling down. In Laos, my nieces sing songs not to touch the bombies. My new next door neighbor is an old F-105 pilot my father picked up from the Hanoi Hilton. He knows my country well. But we don't have much to talk about, except our gardens. My cousin flew into Afghanistan at the start of a new war. We haven't spoken in years. I look at the picture of hell in my mother's temple near Modesto. It's a new year, and young children run with toy guns sold to them by a vendor who could care less about karma and history. Our monks bless every living thing in sight, hoping it will do some good for a change. The Deep Ones From the sea we come, from the sea we come, our mouths, the ends of the world, the salt of the earth unwelcome at the tables and charts of the explorers who expect commodity in flying territory, kingdoms, not wisdom, blood, not heaven's children. We grow with uncertain immortality at the edge not made for man, bending, curving, humming cosmic, awake and alien, our mass a dark and foaming mask, a bed of enigma to certain eyes, one with the moon, one with the stars, one with the ash that whispers history, in the same breath as gods whose Great backs yawn before us as we change of a growing tongue, growling amid the dream ones. We built one blade, one leaf, one golden wall at a time. The ghost, not knock, hates the draft, isn't very good on issues of fertility, but isn't too bad with a lottery if you pay your respects properly by the Takian trees. She's eating diced mangoes with a mouth of ebony ants, kept company by a TV tuned to tacky Thai soap operas, surrounded by white mutts who hate black dogs of any pedigree. Wants a simple life again, to set down the Buddha's yellow candles for just a minute. But she has a lot of karma to pay off for trying to keep her family together, spooking mischievous children at night who think she's looking for playmates for her beautiful baby toddling between Rat Mahabad and the Prakanon River. The grass. Among jade grass blades, even mighty Bodhi trees must share the same earth. 
my last war poem. I tell you, this is the last word for this war, this little side war we were the center of. There is no justice from poetry. Any veteran can tell you that. They want their land, their lives, their livestock back. Grenade fishing in the aftermath of Fouf Hot Tea has lost its novelty to the man with a bullet fragment rattling in his body, slowly tearing him apart. Right, they tell me. Right what? We lost. We were forgotten. We are ghosts. We are victims of fat tigers in foreign policy. There is no Valhalla, only memories of specter gunships. There is no Elysium, only pleas for asylum. This jungle was filthy. There was shit. There was blood. There were refugees who to this day cannot explain why they were the enemy when the war came. The sons fought. The brothers died. The uncles, maimed, were hauled, screaming into the shadow of the plain of jars. Right, they tell me, so people won't forget, so someone will know. Lift the broken bodies with my words, bring them out and say, we did not die in vain. For every bullet hole, let there be a word to stand as a monument. For every lost limb, let there be a sonnet to stitch the truth back together. For every eye gone blind, let there be something to take its place. Something. Anything. How can you not have words for the war of whispers? How can you not shout now that the whispering is done? And I swear, each time I break this promise, that the next time will be the last word I write about this damn war. The Robo Sutra. Like most Lao ventures, it began with amusing, a laugh around rooster year 2600, a jest, the modern Lao epic, Fa Ram Fa Ram. It took a pack of jokers working overtime in the world's largest badek factory in the Lao town quarter of North Minneapolis, automating the stinky process for grandmas and pretty ladies squeamish about fermenting fish and putrid spice. The task was no Hadron Collider, a visionary Hubble, nor a Cray or Retro Difference Engine, but in the age of STEM and T-Punk, service learning and nanopreneurs, they had hearts a tin woodsmen with envy. A key problem in robotics they found encoding free laws declared universal standards. In an e-nutshell, true robots could not harm humans directly or stand idly by while obeying all and protecting themselves in any other hazardous situation. Now, Keen on their karma, conversant on the dharma, punched holes in the notion. Beyond questions of cyborg bioethics, saving clones and 99.9% .9 mostly humans, the vaunted laws presumed everybody came for only one fragile incarnation, and your struggles in your next lives were inconsequential. How narrow. So they set about resolving this scenario. There were, of course, trials and errors. But new laws could drive a robot crazy, guessing how not to harm humans across their lifetimes, wondering what happens if people return a fish, a gecko, a snake, or some ignorant oaf of a swordsman cursed with nigh immortality. But they all grew, trying to grapple with such uncertainties. There were corporations who despised it. Hippie AI had no place in defense industries who relied on being offensive. That was as obvious as a drone above an unmarked building near playgrounds. Little laobouts running around trying only to make people happy, banned from murder and injury, what absurdity, leaving dreadful responsibilities to mere humans. But in times of peace, most agreed, Lao AI wasn't too bad running a city compared to many mayors of prior centuries. But you have to like the elevator more long they play constantly. The spirit catches you and you get body slammed. I came to Missoula to ask him about the inner workings of Uanen, to understand the symbolic significance of split horns and spirit horses who trace their noble smoky path to tones of an auspicious moon above auspicious ancient chin. My tape recorder at the ready, my fountain pen freshly filled with indigo ink, my ears, my eyes, my heart, all were humbly waiting for the wise shaman's words to impart to the next generation of youths who sought this fading voice. He spoke. And my interpreter said, who's your favorite wrestler? I wasn't certain I'd heard properly. Grandpa wants to know who your favorite wrestler is. My interpreter turned back to the shaman, speaking Hmong. Rising with a stately elder's grace, the shaman confidently said, Randy, macho man savage, and struck a macho pose. Smiling, he then offered me a cup of hot coffee. 
I was too stunned to say anything more for the rest of the afternoon. Years later, I still have dreams of shining Shi Yi, smashing riven demons into blue turnbuckles, watching next to a hundred smiling shamans in the audience. The Tuk Tuk Diaries, Part 1 Roar, sputter, and boom, take a hard turn at sixty with a glittering beep beep down a street of mutts and Roman butts. Smoke and flesh, beer splashing, cash flashing, just be wove laced wevel. Take a ride, Falan, and see what a handful of bot and some bargaining gets you by the time that you come to a stop in Bangkok, the city of insomniac angels. Just be sure to watch your luggage at all times. 2. Kasan Road is canned chaos, an eternal Friday of wolf whistles and smoke. Even at noon, you could fall into a raving patch of midnight during a full moon just by stepping into the wrong noodle shop. You can buy crispy critters for a steal or prop up an Aka village for a day for the price of a silver bangle during the down season. The music comes at you like a stranger knocking on your door. Beware of souls trying to make money off of backpack and cheapskates here, weak and of weeds, bad funk and second-hand dreams. They've seen your kind before and can strip your wallet before you've finished your first swallow of a street. At least you can get funny t-shirts here, but they shrink. Catch Tuk Tuk the door sit up and you can see giant golden chitty and tremendous ancient bells. Fire a cheap crossbow just past the Naga's stony mouth and sing your songs of heartbreak to the rain using a karaoke machine among the food stalls. It's beautiful, I hear a henna-haired tourist gush. Her guide, a young boy with a ghastly scorpion tattoo, wants to tell her, take me home with you, but doesn't have a word and just says, where would you like to go to next? Trying not to rush her, hoping she doesn't decide to stay here forever instead. In Laos, there's an army of tuk-tuks at the Talatsao waiting for the right word to go. They slumber, tiny blue dragons, with wheels for eyes and wide mouths for grinning passengers who never seem to come. There aren't many places to go besides home, the vat and the market, and glancing next door at those raucous streets of Hollow, it may be just as well. Fred Between Stone Those old Greeks, they punctured time with their stories, stitching century to century, and I did not see this until 3 a.m. naturally. I was raised on their tales, pebble by pebble, like Aesop's thirsty fox, a scholar in the wake of semiotics and systems theory, so irrelevant when children were master snipers for secret wars on the plain of jars and Afghan mountains, times when the only teachers that mattered in Kosovo were mercenaries. If you stare at the labyrinth long enough, you'll see arrogant Arachne's thread used secretly by Gordius until ambitious Alexander cut that silly knot in two with a sword as sharp as Occam's. As your eyes grow bleary for musty notes, after a time, you will connect those pieces to Ariadne and the trap laid for old Daedalus, father of Icarus and Minotaur traps. One threads the maze with a lair to defeat the furious beast, while the other threads spiral shells with an ant and a string, a beast to defeat an irate patron's riddle. Well, legends are filled with strange ties like that. It's almost Buddhist in its circular irony. Poor Oedipus never saw how he was tripped up by his puzzle, and scholars never noticed he got it only half right, half wrong. The Sphinxian dilemma was no empty koan. What has four legs at morning, two at noon, and free at sunset. What is weakest when it has the most support? Man, the children chirp. Man was the answer that made him kin. No, the question was one of self-knowledge, and the only true response was I. But he could not see himself within the riddle, so he returned to home, to dark fate's decreed, undone by his blindness to his own identity. That's what you get for cheating with the oracle. There are no shortcuts with destiny. The Greeks laid traps like this that took centuries to spring. The whole Trojan War was a conflict of divine metaphors. If that lusty prince had chosen between wisdom or the peaceful hearth and not the promise of freedom and beauties, a thousand men might have different graves. Today, in the heart of Western democracy, as presidents chase interns with their own oral traditions, it's hard not to wince at unknown lessons. And gazing at Egypt, beneath the pyramids of Giza and great royal valleys, there is a world oblivious to all of my mythic meanderings, scorched and bleached to epic simplicity, you will never understand the dreams of mummies until you see a silkworm cocoon 
who aspires to emerge as a butterfly in her next incarnation before someone unravels her for her thread. All right, let's finish this off. Part five of American Laodicea. Today's special of the Xuan Chen, called it in caramelized spice, the suckers of a squid tentacle diced into impotence between my chopsticks and baked. They once clutched at an ocean writhing with life, clasping dearly to each precious bite. What will worms use to hold my bony hands if I don't let my family throw me into the sea, a handful of dust with a hint of squid flavoring? What is the Southeast Asian American poem of tomorrow? It is not hip hop, despite some hopes. It is not slam, it is not even an anti-poem. It is not the form of old Europeans or the resurrected Ghazal. But off his words, I must inform you, will not even resemble or recall the old Tzia, Gadao, or the... Much to our parents' regrets, who pray among vats and steeples for good grandchildren, lucky numbers, and doctors in the family. If our lovely readers do not grow free, we will be unreadable. If our writing is too predictable, we, too, will lie in the ditches unsold. If our words don't speak what's in our hearts, our souls and skulls, we will forget ourselves, our bodies, our shapes, our language. And the true shape of a Southeast Asian American poem of tomorrow will become an exercise in modern myth. What kills a man? Always small things, around, holes, fumes, edges, split atoms, a second, a footstep, a sip, a bite, a word, a cell, a motion, an emotion, a dream, a fool, a bit of salt, a drop, a fragment, a true root of arguments. What kills a man is mysterious only in how minute the culprit behind the blow. We're careless and forget, even when what kills a man is another man. It is a small thing that kills a man, a whole earth, a single grain on a sprawling table filled with the smallest things. What tomorrow takes away? On a good day, the feeling of something left undone, nagging like Mrs. Tolstoy on her deathbed in Astapolfo. On a bad day, the feeling that something has been accomplished, like Mr. Tolstoy's last period for a book called War and Peace. I wish we weren't so obsessed with hope, because in a good world, we wouldn't need it at all. Wisdom. The Greeks say wisdom begins with a face in the mirror that says, I do not know. Sun Tzu needed a lovely girl's head to show that knowing yourself and knowing your foe was enough to win a war best won without a single drop of blood upon those rosy roads filled with beauty. Confucius, with his aging pupils, had enough time to scribble out, it is only the wisest and the very stupidest who cannot change. A lousy old man from Honan in his laid-back way says, Between good and evil, how much difference? On the internet, you can find a copy of the I Ching that will give free readings at a click of a button if you're too lazy to toss the coins in Yarrow with all the reliability of a tarot deck stripped of a minor arcana. Exacting physicists in their duty say, Everything that rises must converge, and every action carries an opposite reaction, equal and pure. The Zen monks in the mountains think they can get away with the, I don't know, a fushiki, and nothing more than an empty fist. If they aren't careful, it will cost all of them their lives. The Chinese say that wisdom begins when you begin calling things by their proper names. An Amway rep, who shall remain anonymous, says, Tough times don't last, but tough people do, and it is best to go into business for yourself, but not by yourself. Such wisdom is as old as the pyramids depending on whom you talk to. In some cultures, it is rude to talk to someone if you have nothing to say, and after a time you might find that saying nothing and saying something amount to the same thing. 
And one man was quoted obscurely, The world is only as large as a man is willing to walk. Exhausted and weary, the GIs in Kuwait say, Wheels are better than heels. Mortal combat between its savage rounds contends, There is no knowledge but is not power. It is not worth losing your head or your heart for a quarter. From the lightless grave, Lord Acton wags his ink-stained fingers powerlessly in disapproval about abuse and absolutes. Thundering Mr. Elliot through an April haze murmured incomprehensibly with a lost Brahmin's lullaby, Data Dayadavam Damyata, while a shrieking young boy from the back streets can only see a wasted mile of indigo ink. It will never be his mantra. The dog whispers conspiratorially, if you cannot kill it or eat it, play with it or sleep with it, or even crap on it, leave it alone. But then again, they say, dreaming dogs lie, don't they? Huxley wishes that in 60 years he could have produced a message more profound than treat people a little more nicely, while Beatles proclaim, all you need is love. And so it goes. After all of this, a young mother looks at me and asks, why bother looking at all, if that's the best you can give? Peering down into that cavernous cradle and her trust in baby's lively smile. How can I come empty-handed? Ypsilanti, 1982. In 36 years, I barely spared a word about my days in Ypsilanti, known chiefly for giving us Iggy Pop and an obscure pioneer in continental drift. I was watching the nine o'clock news with my father in our living room, as was the family habit. I was nine, eating a baby roof in June when a picture of Vincent Chin flashed on screen with a discussion of murder, Japan, and the Motor City. My father said, not to take it personally, we were going to have a barbecue with our blue collar neighbor on Saturday once he was done at the Ford factory. Our other neighbors across the way with the tall, bottle blonde daughters was a best this preacher, fond of discussing Pearl Harbor with me every other day because I couldn't tell him a thing about Laos. Zelkova tree. A friend warned me the other day not to write about the Zelkova or I might come back as one and find myself cut into furniture just as things start to get interesting. The other day, the Zelkova warned me not to worry about my friends or I might stay human and find myself cut in furniture just as things start to get interesting. Zambuda. Utters om, not brains, is not attached to the body, is not attached to the mind. Decay is one aspect of a cycle of birth, life, death, rebirth, redeath. Never perfumes or gilds the self comes back for you, perhaps right behind you. Keep going, he says in his own way. Observes a walk in meditation, does not hurry or drive cars or trucks or tanks or gunships or warplanes. We will not touch money or liquor beyond the vices of lust and greed. Focused, not one possession of a past matters. Old names are useless, accepts every moment of equanimity, no fear. No pain, no anger, no jealousy. Burn him, cut him, shoot him, flee him, free him. It is the same. The old riddle still applies. Meeting the Buddha on the road, you can say nothing to him. You cannot remain silent. What do you do? You will destroy him to be comfortable. Some will follow his path, become one with him, laughing at the dancing bones of Zen, the lessons of an uncertain universe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and I look forward to sharing more with you in the future.